wow, it feels amazing to be up here. How is everybody doing right now? Good? I know. Yeah, isn't this an awesome conference? Yeah, come on, people, give me some clapping. I got to get some energy. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, today I'm going to be talking about something that's uh, a bit weird to talk about at a Ruby conference. I'm going to be talking about type safety. Um, and that's something that you normally don't think about um, when you're coding in Ruby, because uh, Ruby is dynamically typed, um, and everything sort of happens at runtime. Um, we sort of ship it out there and see what happens when we run tests or when we run it in production. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ryan Levick. I'm Itchy Ankles on Twitter. Please don't ask. Um, Hey, hey. Um, and I, I want to tell you something. I absolutely love Ruby. I love it to death. Um, I work at, at Wonderlist. Um, we use Ruby all over the place uh, amongst other languages. Um, but really, my, my first love in programming uh, was Ruby, uh, so much so that I, I really want to give a shout out to this guy up here, Matt's. Um, without him, without the contribution of everybody who's, who's uh, contributed to Ruby, um, I would still be doing marketing, and, uh, and that would make me sad. Um, basically, this was me before Ruby right here, in fact, um, and, and this was me after. So, so Ruby has truly, truly made a difference. And, and why is Ruby so great? Why? Uh, because Ruby is readable, and it's expressive, and it's flexible, and these are all things that I don't need to tell you because you already know that, or you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in this already. Um, you know, it's not like this, what we have in some other languages, where we have the full, the full language, and then there's a little subsection that's the good parts. Uh, Ruby is sort of is the, the opposite of this. Most of it is the good parts. Um, I thought Ruby was perfect when I started out with Ruby. I thought, how could there be anything better than this? This has to be the best. Um, but in fact, no one is perfect, not even Ruby. For one thing, Ruby is pretty slow, right? I mean, everybody knows that Ruby is slow. We have things like Rubinius to, to help us with this and JRuby. Um, that's sort of a given. But what else does Ruby lack? Um, and we're going to be talking about one of, one of these things that Ruby lacks. Let's take a look at some examples. Here we have a simple, a simple method that adds one to whatever we pass in here. And really what this says is x has to be something that responds to the message plus. Right? That's all this really says. Um, but what happens if x is nil? Right? So we might do something like this. And hopefully, hopefully all of you are looking at this and say, I would never write something like this. Um, because this is some ugly ass code right here. Really, really not good, um, but it's, it's very defensive. I'm going to make sure that we don't end up with those ugly uh, nil exceptions. There's other things we can do. We can go ahead and say, unless x responds to, to plus, raise some argument error. And hopefully, that will catch it uh, before we end up with those weird um, undefined method plus for nil class uh, things way down the line. Um, but really, what we end up doing, instead of these defensive tactics, is we just test the shit out of our Ruby code. We throw test after test after test at it um, until we end up with this, this code right here that I'm testing here is only three lines of Ruby code, and I put 244 tests on it. That's pretty crazy, right? I'm kidding. It's actually a full Rails application. But, um, <laughs> But it sort of seems like that sometimes. We have to just throw test after test at it until we feel somewhat OK and confident that what we've put into production works, right? Um, we, we still end up with errors, though. We still end up with things like this. We have all these services out there um, where we, we catch these exceptions in production. And you know, on Monday morning, because it's Friday, we don't want to deal with it. And, you know, on Monday morning, we'll come back and we'll fix this error. But until then, our, our customers out there will be experiencing this sort of exception. So how, how can we fix this? How, what is there out there that can prevent this from happening? If only there was an automated way to find these errors. If only. It's called static typing, right? And you might think, did this guy just mention static typing at a Ruby conference? Is he insane? Don't we hate static typing? Like, static typing is evil, right? This is the setting where you write static typing in, right? <laughs> no? 
I don't work in a cubicle. This is what I wear to work. I'm actually dressed up today. Normally, I show up in a bathrobe. But uh, th this is what you, where you would work if you, if you use static typing. And no wonder we feel like this. This is probably some incorrect Java code, because I don't care about Java. But uh, you can see that we have to say int and int and int and you know, all these return statements. And who wants to write this crap? Like, shouldn't the thing just figure it out? Like, why do I care? And the answer is, well, actually, th there are languages out there that are not Java uh, that do this way better. Um, we have something called type reference that helps us with this kind of thing. Does anybody have any idea what language this is right here? Haskell. Yes, this is Haskell. And this is fully statically checked. So you cannot pass anything. Let's say it determine, will determine that x is an int. Really, it determines it's, it's some number. Um, and it will check that before you run your code. So we know that we can't end up with those nasty errors, that we've done something wrong. Because right before we even run the code, a compiler tells us, hey, you screwed up, man. You, you shouldn't do that. Um, and we don't have to annotate it with all these ugly int here, int there, blah, blah, blah. You know, the computer does that for us, because we're lazy. So OK, hopefully I've at least shown you that we can have the static typing, and we don't really have to pay a huge price for it in terms of annotating everything with their types. But what does this actually get us? What, even if this is true, why should I care? I get along great with my ducks and Ruby, right? So let's take a look at an example. So hopefully this isn't uh, too much code to go through. This is some Ruby. Um, and basically what it is is a method called decorate user that takes a user and then delegates off to a user decorator. Um, and when we actually call this, we first find the user, we decorate the user, and then we, you know, we respond or something like that. Um, and then when we run it, we end up with an error like this. And the thing is, if we look at where that error is happening, it's happening in user decorator line 30. Now, the problem with that is that that is nowhere near where the problem actually bubbles into effect. If anybody notices, when we look back here, the real problem, most you know, Rails developers will spot it immediately. You'll see that find by, of course, can return nil. But then it gets passed into the, the user decorator. Oops. It gets passed into the user decorator, goes all the way down, probably gets thrown around a bunch of times. Um, and then we finally get our error. And we have to go in with our debugger, open up Pry or something, our Ruby debugger, something like that. And finally, you know, six hours later and 13 cups of coffee, we found our, uh, our error. Now, m maybe I'm exaggerating in this uh, particular example, but there have been times, I know everyone is out here, that they've searched for an error, basically essentially a type error, um, and they've spent hours doing it until they find that magical line that screwed everything up. Um, but there's a way to avoid this kind of this thing with nil, where nil can, can nip us in the butt. So this is our first example of where having sort of a, a statically typed uh, a type here can help us avoid these errors. And that type is the option type. So I'm using sort of Scala syntax here mostly, just because it's semi-ish familiar to Rubyus. But um, hopefully nothing should be too scary for anybody in this room. Um, I'm going to have this type called option of int. And we can have option of anything, option of string, or option of my type, option of user, option of whatever. And some particular values of option of int are either there's some, let's say five, or some six, or some seven, or there's none. And you might say, well, OK, what's the difference between having five or nil here? And, and the difference is what we'll see in a second when we get our error. Now, here's the same exact code that we had before, except this time it's, uh, this is actually our Ruby code. This is the code written in Scala. Um, and it's using the option type. So user.findby will actually return an option of user instead of user or nil. And what that means is when we run it, we see, whoa, whoa, whoa. Our user decorator here expects to receive a user, uh, or an option of user. And, or excuse me, it expects to see, receive a user, and you've passed in an option of user. You need to basically convince the, the line of path in your code that this thing actually, there is a user there. And of course, there are ways to do that, um, that dive into the Scala syntax that we don't want to, to talk to. But um, here we can see that the problem in our code happens in our code, right where the problem arises, instead of somewhere deep inside of our, our user decorator class. So there we can have, we can basically, with this type, completely, 100% eliminate these types of errors, um, undefined method whatever for nil class or, or nil pointer exceptions in Java. Uh, 
they don't need to exist at all. There's no reason for them to. There are patterns um, codified in types that basically allow the compiler to prevent us from making these mistakes. Because you're never going to want to call name or email on nil. You just will never want to do that. But wait, 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 wait. Isn't this also a bit more intention revealing as well? Doesn't this expose our intent a bit more than what we had before? Let's take this sort of uh, method uh, uh, signature here. And if you're not familiar with the syntax, basically this is fine. It takes an ID of type int and returns a user. The only problem is we have a tiny bit, a tiny little asterisk. Can anybody read what that says right there? It says it, it may return nil, maybe. We don't know. It's sort of hidden off in the documentation somewhere. And we have no way of enforcing this except for us to be good developers and make sure that we check for nil or you know, hope that we always find the user. But if we do this, if we say find actually returns an option of user, well, then we know, OK, the user could be there or it couldn't. We've sort of exposed the truth to the type signature. We've sort of told everybody. We've documented in our code the fact that this is a possibility instead of in implicitly relying on the fact that, oh, yeah, I know this could return nil. Let's take another example. This is like a, a fake thing for Redis, fetching some, some value for a key in Redis. And here we have the same exact thing. We return a string. Well, except, you know, if the connection to Redis, like, screws up, eh, maybe it'll raise an error. But we don't see that in our documentation. We don't see that in our type signature. We're just relying on the fact that, you know, I read it sometime, or, you know, Bob over there told me, Mary told me yesterday that this is a possibility. Um, instead, we can do something like this. We have the same type of method, except it returns either an error or a string. So we sort of exposed again the fact that this thing can raise, not raise an error, but return an error or return the actual string. We've brought it up to the forefront. But you might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. OK, this, is, this sounds OK, I guess. But I mean, isn't this what tests are for? Like, I write tests so that when, yeah, maybe I get an error when I run my test, but it won't go into production. I swear it won't. But I have a question. Does anybody know what the best testing library ever invented was? Does anybody have any clue? Compiler. The compiler. Close, but not quite. There's one more that's better. And the compiler uses this as its as background testing library. Puts. Puts. No. <laughs> <laughs> Puts debugging is effective, sure, but it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, yep, puts this, and then you change it to the next line and the next line. And, Oh, that's really, that's really frustrating. No, the correct answer is actually something that this guy used. Does anybody have any clue? Something that this woman used. There we go. Something that this guy used as well. Yes, that's right, it's math. Math is the best testing library ever invented. Why is that? Because math is true. Um, if anybody in here can come up with a way of proving that math is not true, then I will hand you your Nobel Prize. Congratulations. What's that? Yes, the undecidability uh, uh, something is, I would love to talk to you about that. We won't get into that, but it turns out that most of the time, undecidability when it comes to types is not relevant. These things are usually decidable. So what I'd like to talk in terms of math is about uh, something that these two gentlemen came up with. Um, it's called the Curry-Howard correspondence, and it's something that this is Mr. Curry and Mr. Howard here. Um, if anybody knows of currying and functional programming or the language Haskell, um, the guy uh, over here on the left uh, gave his name to both of those things. So basically what this means in layman's terms is that for all inputs, a valid and correct output is given. Um, I could give a more formal definition, but we don't need that. This is essentially correct. It's, it's always present and cannot be forgotten. Just because you know, we forgot in our documentation that this thing returns an, an option of user doesn't mean it's not there. It's there. It cannot be erased. Who here, let's be honest, be honest with me, who here has erased a test before? It's been failing and you erased it. Uh huh? Yep. Everybody else here who's not raising their hand is lying. I know it. <laughs> or maybe I'm just a terrible programmer. I don't know. So 
Also, the compiler is far, far, far less likely to be buggy than your tests are. Of course, the compiler can be buggy, but you have lots of people looking at the compiler, and you have you and your buddy working on your code base, and that's it. What's, what's probably going to be more correct, something that's tested in millions of code bases or your test that you wrote late on a Friday night. And what this really lets us do is sort of test what is important. I'm not suggesting that testing is unimportant. Um, no, no type system that we've come up with so far will make sure that you're returning the string Bob instead of the string Mary when that's the user's name. It's just you need to run tests. But what you test is your business logic. That's all you test. And instead of testing these incidental things, this incidental complexity that you've introduced, you test the things that truly matter. And that's wonderful. That's mathematical. And if you're wondering why I chose this picture, it's because it's really disturbing. And I like that. So, so let's look at another example. We'll look at a function called head. Um, and what head does, and, and Ruby usually call this first, um, it's taking the first thing in a list or in an array. And here we delegate to that first method in Ruby. We take a list and we call first on it and we get that item out. Of course, if the list is empty, then we can raise an argument error because we don't want to return nil. We just we want to always return the head of the list. And an empty list has no head. So okay, if it's empty, let's raise an argument error. Or, you know, we just learned about this awesome option type, so let's get freaking fancy. And we'll return my Ruby option type. This is a terrible idea because Ruby is not built for this. So this is just kind of confusing and not idiomatic, and people will probably be confused. I've tried to do this before, and I just erased my entire code base because it's not, it's not pretty in Ruby. So let's look at an example of a language that does support something like this, that really brings these ideas to the forefront. Uh, has anybody here heard of Idris before? Do we have any Haskell programmers in the room? Any at all? Oh, very, very few. All right. Um, so this is the new sauce for Haskell programmers. They've sort of moved on. So if you thought Haskell was, was the crazy stuff, uh, this is what Haskell programmers think is the crazy stuff. Um, we're going to be looking at this. This is the head function in, in Idris. Um, and we're going to... We're going to dissect it piece by piece, because obviously, if you've never done functional programming before or you've never looked at Idris, this could be a slightly confusing, right? So we'll just go one section at a time. We have our function called head here. That's all this is saying. This colon right here just means everything after this until the new line is a type signature. That's all this is saying. And here we have our argument for our function. Now, let me break this up into the three parts that it is. One, vec. That means it's a vector, so it's a uh, basically an, ar an array of variable length. Um, the second part of it, the s of n, is basically saying this vector cannot be empty. Um, if you don't understand why that says that, it doesn't matter because that's not important for this talk, but trust me, this says this vector cannot be empty. I am encoding it in the type system. And then the a says that this vector is filled with things of type a, whatever that type is, int, string, bool, my type, whatever, user, who cares. And then the next part says we will return something of that type a. So if, if the vector was full of strings, we will return a string. If the vector is full of ints, we will return an int. In the next line, we have the implementation of that. So again, we say this is our implementation for head. And then we sort of do something that Rubyists are somewhat familiar. Um, it's pattern matching and destructuring based on that pattern match. So we know that we have one argument here. And what this says is I'm going to break that list, that vector, rather, into a head and then rest or tail. So I will have the head of the list cons onto or prepended to the tail of that vector. It's sort of like, oops, it's sort of like this in, in Ruby where we, we break up the array and we get x and y out of it by, by destructuring that argument. And then we return that head. So we have effectively gotten the head of the list. So why is this so cool? Because this. When you run head on an empty list, you get this error. Now this may seem like, what's the big deal? We got errors in Ruby as well. This happens at compile time. So this code will not even run. It's not even actually being run with real values in it. It's saying, this is not a valid program. This breaks my type. Just like you can't call 
um, in Java, you cannot pass in a Boolean where you said you pass in an int. This will not allow you to pass in an empty list when, you, uh, when you've said that you will pass in a list with things in it. So that means that we can basically, with this, eliminate all runtime errors. There's no need to have a runtime error because all incorrect programs, all programs that will throw an error, will go ahead and be caught at compile time. Has anybody ever seen this guy before, Michael Bernstein? He's an awesome, super awesome Rubyist um, that everybody should watch uh, uh, his talks on YouTube. And um, uh, he's a personal hero of mine, even though we've never met. Um, and he is really into this kind of stuff. Um, he's a Rubyist, but he likes type systems and actually um, has gotten quite deep into them. He works for Code Climate. And um, at Code, one day he decided, well, what if we bring these ideas to Ruby? What would happen? So he built something where you basically annotate your, your uh, methods in Ruby with type signatures. So this says, do not even like, run, be able to run my Ruby code unless I can prove that this is the type of this function. And there's also other dynamic languages like Erlang that have sort of a similar idea. In Erlang, you have something called the dialyzer, which basically statically checks your dynamic Erlang code. You can annotate your types and say, this is what this function accepts. And if it doesn't, then it will just won't run. It will never run. But I got to ask, is this what we want? Like, doesn't this defeat the purpose of Ruby? Ruby is dynamic, and that's, that's great. That's why we love Ruby. Huzzah! Ruby is awesome. But there's one thing. Ruby is a tool. That's all it is. You are not married to Ruby. Ruby is not the end all and be all. It is not the, the end solution to every problem that you will have. Know, know that when you, when you choose Ruby, you are giving up the power that we have just seen here. You will never have this in Ruby. And if that's OK for your domain and your problem, then great. But maybe it's not. Maybe you need that reliability. There's a, a really great book called Zen and the Art of the Motorcycle Maintenance uh, that um, me and my, my colleague, Chad Fowler, have talked about quite a bit. There's an idea in that book called value rigidity, where you basically become so in love with a concept that you can't even critique it. And that's my fear for the Ruby community. Ruby is amazing, and we all know that. But that doesn't mean it's not flawed. That doesn't mean that we can't look at Ruby and critique it for what it is. So don't be afraid to ask yourself when you're starting a new project, is Ruby the best tool for this job? Because the answer may be no, and that's OK. We should know what we're giving up when we make these choices. We should know that we've made a choice in the first place, and the choice isn't given to us by the fact that we're in love with Ruby. Thank you. Um, what kind of practical problems have you come up with um, at Wonderlist where you thought, OK, we can't use Ruby here for? <laughs> for type problems? Uh, I mean, at my day job, the, it really normally comes down to performance above anything. Uh, that's due to our architecture. We write very small code bases where if we were to write it, we wouldn't necessarily need to have something that's completely um, type safe because the code is so extremely small that we can essentially get by without that. Um, but there are definitely pl places outside of that, like. Um, when you're writing a, a compiler itself or you're writing a web server where these ideas really do come into to, uh, to play because you want a system that you can change and know that you don't have to have written good tests to make sure that it works. You can rely on something that's mathematically sound in order to ensure that it's correct. Um, other than that, there are just a lot of languages that are, have these things and they're a lot of fun to play with, like Haskell, for instance, which we do use. Any more questions? I'd be happy to talk about this at any time. I'm obsessed with this stuff. So um, I will come find you if you don't ask me a question then. Cool. <laughs> Let's give Ryan a really warm hand. Well